Hello, everybody. Uh, could not be more thrilled to close out this amazing trust converse, conference. And I am well aware for those of you who are in the UK and Europe that we are maybe the only thing standing between you and probably a well-deserved cocktail at the end of this extraordinary day. Um, so we will try to keep it interesting for you. Um, my name is Vivian Schiller. I am the executive director of Aspen Digital. We are a program of the Aspen Institute focused on all things at the intersection of media, the internet, technology, and these days, democracy. Um, and I am so happy to be in conversation with my friend, Craig Newmark. So let me just say, well, first of all, hello, Craig. I should acknowledge your presence. Nice to see you before I say a few words about you. My presence is acknowledged. Okay, thank you. So here are some things you need to know about Craig. Um, I'll start with the thing that you probably already know about Craig, which was he was the founder of the eponymous Craigslist. Um, he is no longer part of Craigslist, but I think uh, it is fair to say that Craigslist is one of the most um, important and seminal um, uh, uh, moments, institutions, products, and in, in basically the development of uh, the internet. Um, but we're not here to talk about that today, but it's important to know that about Craig. Here are some other things you need to know about Craig. Craig loves birds, particularly pigeons. Um, related to pigeons, he is a fan of uh, urban rodent memes. He would be happy to share those with you. If you follow him on Twitter, you will get um, a whole bunch of them. He is a uh, practitioner and connoisseur of uh, the dad joke. Um, in fact, uh, one of his, my favorite dad jokes of his is that he has now taken to calling himself the Forrest Gump of the internet, which I think is pretty true because Craig is pretty much in all the places at all the most um, important times. Um, and lastly, but most importantly, and what we're here to talk about today, Craig is one of the most, if not the most significant individual funders in journalism and information ecosystems in the world. His uh, generosity is really extraordinary. Everything from journalism um, institutions like the American Journalism um, Project in the US, the markup which he uh, made happen, um, to international groups that look at standards like the um, Journalism Trust Initiative and the Trust Project, cybersecurity and cyber civil defense initiatives. He has been a great supporter and funder of um, efforts to uh, mitigate toxicity online, especially towards women and underrepresented uh, communities. Uh, he's a great supporter of teachers. He's a great supporter of veterans. I think I mentioned this, food security, he also is a funder of research and action uh, in terms of mis and disinformation or what we in Aspen call information disorder. And I should at this point acknowledge that Craig has been a generous uh, funder of our work in the mis and disinformation space, particularly um, enabled the information on uh, the Commission on Information Disorder work that we just published um, earlier uh, this week. So, um, so. That is Craig, all of those things um, all at once. Uh, and we're gonna be here to talk about the role of philanthropy. So Craig, I, I've got a, an opening question for you, which is partly did I, you think I characterized you uh, uh, correctly in all of your dimensions? And then I wanna ask you a little bit about how you got into the philanthropy space. Um, I think it's pretty good. The Forrest Gump reference is an old joke which I recently realized is closer to true. For 20 to 30 years, I've been uh, accidentally in the right place at the right time. And uh, for 20 to 30 years, in my attempts to simulate human social behavior and, and skills, I've uh, accidentally created networks and relationships, um, which have all been uh, very effective. This makes me the Forrest Gump of the internet and I'd like to assure everyone that the internet is a box of chocolates. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I uh, take exception to there is that you accidentally created uh, these networks of people doing good work. I think there was nothing accidental about it. But but let's back up. Okay, so take us uh, briefly from um, 
you uh, from Craigslist to your philanthropy work today? How did you make that transition and why? Um, over the last uh, decade or so of my time at Craigslist, people and nonprofits kept asking for help in different forms, often in community building, uh, sometimes fundraising, uh, a lot of areas. And I started getting involved in the nonprofit world slowly and just started uh, increasing it. At some point in this process, I realized that, uh, oh, the people at Craigslist don't need me anymore, and I should start thinking about retiring. And that's natural for a man of my advanced uh, years. And meanwhile, I realized that there are philanthropic uh, opportunities for me to make a real difference in the world, particularly after I was informed about what was happening uh, to the U.S. in terms of uh, disinformation warfare. This plays a big role uh, in the U.S., also Western democracies everywhere. So I just kept taking on a larger and larger role until I found myself actually a philanthropist. Not a title I sought, but a title that kind of landed on me. Yeah, well, you, it may have landed on you, but you, you wear it very well. Um, you know, it's interesting that the, that the, uh, the, the name of this conference uh, is the Trust Conference. And I think if I look across all of your priority areas of your philanthropic work, probably the one thing that threads through all of them, whether it's about veterans, whether it's about teachers, whether it's about uh, uh, information security, cybersecurity, or toxicity, it is about trust. Um, would, you, would, you, would you say that really trust is sort of part of the driving trust, increasing trust in a, in a, in a world that is seeing so little of it is, is, is part of your objective? Well, I guess uh, in Sunday school, Mr. and Mrs. Levin uh, told us that we should treat people like we want to be treated. And that uh, implies a very uh, large amount of trust. We do the best we can uh, as people. So we try to follow through on that. For that matter, they also told us that it's uh, not okay to bear false witness. You should always do the, uh, do the opposite. And that's part of another commitment uh, to trust. Uh, the deal is they taught me an awful lot and I didn't realize how important that was, how much I internalized like uh, 60 years ago and how that helps motivate pretty much everything I do. This is a big deal as I look forward uh, to living through my, uh, my final years and to prepare for what I do uh, beyond those years. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you have, uh, I think you're, you have uh, many, uh, many, many final years left and you're still in touch with Mr. And Mrs. Levin's family, I think. Um, maybe an important not their family, yeah. but another big influence uh, on me in this area in high school, U.S. history and civics, yeah. Mr. Shulsky taught me things like our government is based on informed consent of the governed and the press is very important because how else can we give informed consent? Like I say, a trustworthy press is the immune system of democracy. All variations on the theme of trust and what it really means in our daily lives. Yeah, it, yeah, certainly, certainly, certainly is. So, you know, a lot of your initial um, philanthropic giving was centered around uh, journalism, um, but it's your thinking um, has evolved it seems like um, I, I've heard you talk about sort of up-leveling from gifts that support individual operations of institutions and maybe more systems, uh, systems uh, giving across a number of, of areas, whether it's you know the journalism trust initiative or or uh, information operations. So say a little bit more about sort of your 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 theory of change, if we want to be fancy about it, or just how your focus has evolved from you know individual organizations to systems? Well, it's, it's commonplace to observe that in uh, some areas, like information warfare, we're all in this together. And then I think about my uh, parents, who were part of what uh, some call the greatest generation. In World War II, everyone was expect, expected to play uh, their part, sometimes easier to do so, sometimes uh, hard to do so, but everyone was expected to play their role. 
And so I'm uh, trying to do that on a, a national basis, but also trying to fund those organizations which are working together for the common good. For example, this includes a number of groups across the U.S. and beyond the U.S., like the Stanford Internet Observatory or the Center for an Informed Public at the uh, University of Washington, Shorenstein Center at Harvard Kennedy School, or also there's a bunch of folks at something called Aspen Digital doing a lot of great work. Never heard of them. The idea is that we're all in this together, and now I'm thinking that when it comes to uh, matters of, uh, well, warfare waged via informational uh, means, that is, I'm ta- thinking about cybersecurity attacks, Internet of Things attacks, ransomware, and so on. Very much we're all in this together. And this is different than World War II in that this is largely informational warfare, not kinetic warfare. And these attacks, for the most part, are occurring on U.S. soil. Those are different than what happened in the past. And... Uh, Again, we all have a role to play here. I am now trying to figure out what makes up a cyber civil defense. I'm thinking about the duck and cover exercises I uh, engaged in 60 years ago. And what does that mean now? Because we do need a strong national uh, defense regarding disinformation and cybersecurity, but also regular people, we gotta learn how to protect our homes and businesses. So you see um, a a strong connection between cybersecurity, the the increasing risk and proliferation of uh, hacking, DDoS attacks, individuals, uh, ransomware, individuals becoming more vulnerable, and information warfare, as you would put it. You see mis- and disinformation and the weaponization of information. You see those two things as two parts of a whole. I do see all these things as uh, pretty closely related and involving mutual defense. Uh, The deal is that I think we need uh, tools that we run on our phones, for example, because it seems most everyone who's vulnerable has an Android phone or an Apple phone. And I'd like uh, tools which run on our phones telling us what's going on in our own uh, networks, telling us what uh, devices are normally there, and if something pops up that we didn't expect, we need to get a notification pretty fast. Even more so, I'd like us to have tools that run at home in our businesses that uh, keep an eye on things, and if anything looks uh, funny, then they could uh, pop up a different notification. These tools are under development, and I have a feeling I'm going to be spending a certain amount of time uh, looking into them. Yeah. So cybersecurity at a national level, national security level at an enterprise level, and very much on a, on a personal level. Start with two-factor authentication, folks, and change your passwords. That, that, would, be, that, that would cover a lot, actually, <laughs> right there. Um, Craig, you know, one of your, uh, you mentioned this earlier, but it, I've noticed, you know, in your, I've known you for quite a number of years now, and I've noticed a shift uh, over the last few years, along with a shift from your philanthropic giving being focused on individual organizations and looking more at systems, that also your um, your strategy, and this is something that you request or frankly demand as you should of your um, of the of the organizations you donate to, that they work together, that they create networks where they are supporting each other and. Uh, and and sort of advancing the ball on whatever topic it is. So talk a little bit about how you make that happen and and and, and how that's played out. Yeah, um, I'm now contributing substantially to maybe two or three hundred organizations, depending on how you count and how much I've lost track of them uh, today. Um, it is important that they all work together because of that. We're all in this together thing, but also different people are providing different parts of solutions. And also organizations need to protect each other because if an organization actually gets something good going, they are possibly subject to some kind of fake or manufactured culture war. That's how things work in the uh, US today. So people need to work together. They need to protect each other, I feel. 
and they need to help each other get the word out about what they're doing. These are some of the things that I strongly request and nudge my grantees into that direction. Yeah. To that effect, I use a Google Groups-based uh, mailing list. And uh, the deal there is that because I have no imagination, I call it Craig's New List. Yeah. Uh, however, I have a very, very dry sense of humor. Uh, there have been unexpected benefits uh, of doing things this way because, uh, oh, because, uh, oh, people just exercise their own synergy as I do this. They form alliances and groups without my uh, active participation or involvement or even knowledge. And that's kind of the whole history uh, of uh, Craigslist because the internet, in fact, is a box of chocolates. Uh, <laughs> The only demand which I think I put, which is a real burden on my grantees, is that I do ask people to uh, um, to tolerate my sense of humor without in any manner encouraging my sense of humor. Which, of course, we all do because we can't help ourselves. Uh, yeah, I think it's actually really extraordinary. So, you know, in the same way that Craigslist was such a simple idea, but so effective. Craig's new list, I will say that I heard skepticism from some corners. I can, I, can, I can reveal this to you now, Craig, when you first started this list of another listserv. But I have to say, I, uh, <laughs> I come into my inbox, but that was the beginning. And all of the skepticism has now melted away because I see in real time, the first of all, the um, all of your grantees supporting each other, tweeting each other, amplifying the message and saying, wait a minute, you're working on this, I'm working on that, let's get together. And all kinds of magic is beginning um, to happen. So that kind of democratization of your, um, and kind of networking among your grantees, I think is highly effective and something I think other philanthropic organizations should. It's somehow uh, working, echoing the uh, success of Craigslist. And the best example of this is in the effort to counter that harassment, uh, mostly directed against women journalists. There are now multiple groups working together to come up with tools, talking to a lot of journalists, uh, tools which may help uh, journalists fight back against harassers and get mutual support, which may make a difference in some ways that really do matter. Um, nothing ready to be announced now, possibly ready to be announced uh, soon. Watch this space, everybody. Uh, you know, you are, talk a little bit about, because there's people uh, that, are, that are watching um, this program uh, are all over the world. Talk about how you think in terms of your philanthropic giving, US versus global. I'd say the lion's share of your giving is to US organizations, but not exclusively. And how do you think about that? Um, well, there's so much I don't know about the world outside of the US. I've learned enough to know that my ignorance is vast. Uh, for example, the concept of free speech is different when you compare that concept in the US versus the UK versus Europe. And when I learned that, that's when I began to learn how much I don't know. So I do talk to people, I try to do what makes sense in these areas and I listen elsewhere, but I'm not going to be uh, intrusive. Um, I talk to people and I do something that makes sense, but I try to, uh, oh, I try to avoid intruding in other people's decisions in terms of what makes sense in other places. As I uh, may play a bit of more of a role in other places, um, I just try really careful to respect other people's attitudes, different cultural attitudes, and what's most difficult for me, other people's senses of humor. <laughs> well, you're, uh, it strikes me that the giving that you give to uh, on, on a global level are, are, are uh, organizations that will have an impact across the world. Again, systems, systems uh, solutions, like the Journalism Trust Initiative, of course, which was uh, came out of the uh, reporter's uh, without borders, which is uh, you to, and and you you funded other like institutions as well, like the like the trust initiative. But that is something that addresses a, an issue that is has cross national implications. 
Yeah. I uh, would like to think that I'm trying to address some universal concerns. For example, that it's uh, unethical for any news distributor to uh, amplify disinformation. That's to say that if you're distributing news, whether you're a news outlet or a social media platform, please don't amplify disinformation. You're making things worse. And I'm hoping that's a universal value because I'm alluding to the, uh, well, there's that ninth commandment uh, in the judeo christian Bible saying it's wrong to bear false witness. And I'm hoping that's relatively universal, but I need to hear back from uh, other people. It's kind of like you want to treat people like you want to be treated. That I'm assured is universal, but I need to ask people about these things. And then I need to ask more. And I figure I need to keep uh, doing it for another 20 to 30 years, after which it's uh, not my problem anymore. <laughs> I think I think both uh, both bearing false witness and treating people like they want to be treated still uh, needs a little work in some uh, corners of uh, society. I want to now just pivot in our remaining time to talk a little bit about philanthropy uh, in general and the impact that philanthropy can play, particularly in relation to um, policy. So we look in the United States. This is something that our Commission on Information Disorder that you um, were a part of. Um, really looked at, which is in the in the topic, for instance, in the U U.S. of what to do about the collapse of local news and how do we regenerate local news? Um, since the business models have changed, advertising has sort of uh, it, you know dried up at least to the to the levels that are needed to sustain it. You know what? How much can philanthropy do? What is the role of the government when it comes to journalism? When it comes to um, mis and disinformation when it comes to information security. How do you think about, uh, again, philanthropy versus public policy? Okay. When it comes to uh, local journalism, uh, what we need are to evolve models which allow local journalism to thrive because it's in the local uh, papers or whatever that we hear what's going on with our school board or in city hall. And for that matter, in terms of local journalism online in real time, one of my favorite questions is like, uh, what's that smell? <laughs> um, in national issues, there are well, a lot of pragmatic matters, for example, getting into uh, fighting disinformation or strengthening our nation's cybersecurity defenses. Sometimes there are questions that need to be raised which have to be done from uh, the political environment, which can be uh, toxic at times. It depends on the uh, area. Um, but sometimes philanthropists can bring up things which are very difficult for people in political office to bring up. There's jurisdictional matters, um, both in the US and uh, elsewhere, because in a lot of countries, um, there are, uh, there's law and regulation telling an agency where they can fight the good fight. Uh, for example, some government agencies can help protect the country um, from attacks happening within the country, but they can't really go overseas to fight. And that's true and vice versa. There are government agencies like the Department of Defense, which protect us primarily uh, uh, outside our borders, but are very limited for good reasons as to what they can do inside our borders. Philanthropists, we have less power to fight the good fight anywhere really, but we can cross jurisdictions in uh, reasonable ways. But also as government agencies get really smarter about fighting the battle inside boundaries and then outside boundaries, we can bring together those agencies and nonprofits who are charged with fighting the good fight, we can bring together uh, those with the nonprofits who are really good at understanding the online rights issues. For example, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the ACLU, EPIC, and CDT. So by bringing those groups together, um, EFF maybe with uh, Homeland Security, we can actually uh, build into the DNA the uh, well, respect 
for our rights within those agencies. For example, we can keep reminding government agencies that we have a Bill of Rights and that we have due process embedded in them. So, so philanthropists as a whole, the power is obviously the power to fund the kind of research that may be needed, the power of the microphone that you have, the power uh, which, you know, we, we, you don't have the restrictions, your convening power um, and your ability, again, to create these networks um, is, is, is where you see the role. Do you work uh, with other philanthropic organizations, coordinate with other philanthropic uh, organizations to align around work you want to get uh, done so your money can go further? Yeah, the, uh, a lot of uh, what my approach is about is getting the practitioners in these areas to work together, to convene them, and for that matter, to get the funders of these areas to talk with each other so that uh, good groups get uh, some funding and some additional influence for that matter. Now, convening skills require uh, uh, good social behavior and social skills. And like I tell people, have you met me? So instead, I find people who do have those uh, social skills who would be good at convening. And so, for example, in cybersecurity, I uh, talk to the people at Hewlett Foundation, like Kelly Bourne, and I talk to other people at uh, something called Aspen Digital to take on the convening burden that I feel that I may uh, not be accomplished at. And that's a good way to approach uh, you know, compensating for those skills that I uh, don't have. I, uh, I, I'm not going to go down that road because, uh, uh, Craig, you are a, a joy to be around in any in any context. So we have very little time left. I want to just spend literally two minutes talking about what's next. You, I, we got you to admit that you've got 20 or 30 years left at least. So uh, how are you thinking about, um, about, about what is next? If there's one thing I know about you, it's that you're, um, you're, you're constantly evolving um, the way that you approach your philanthropy and your involvement. So, so give us a little preview, even if you, I don't mean to reveal any announcements, but just generally thinking about how you're approaching the work going forward. Well, I need to get other people to do a much better job in those areas that I support. Um, for example, the Aspen Commission report on uh, uh, information dis uh, disorder, uh, that's going along, uh, that's gotten off to a great start, and I just need to help keep the momentum going. On cybersecurity, I have a feeling I need to exert um, the convening skills of other people to get things going in those areas, but I have a feeling I'm going to need to be pushing hard on this idea of a cyber civil defense. It's not like duck and cover like 60 years ago, but we need together to work to protect our homes and our businesses and the country. When it comes to protecting people against harassment, which is a really big problem online, that's the reason for creating a uh, network, which we'll start with women journalists who get the worst of it, but We'd like to evolve mechanisms which will help people protect themselves and each other, making the whole internet a much more civil place. It's a start. Those are big areas that I work on. I'm not neglecting areas like voter protection or veteran support, women in tech. I'm not neglecting uh, pigeon rescue, and they may not need to be rescued so much. You probably couldn't hear uh, but as we were speaking, pigeons were trying to break into one of the bird feeders intended for smaller birds. But we now have enough uh, pigeons uh, to field uh, two uh, soccer or football teams, which is uh, only a Ted Lasso reference. I did hear that vi very violent banging, and I guess that was the pigeons trying to break through because they you, they know you uh, you love them, Craig. So, uh, Jesus, so it was the pigeons. Yeah. So. Cybersecurity, uh, cyber civil defense, um, harassment, mitigation of harassment, a worldwide issue, and information disorder. Um, big priorities. Still, still recognizing your focus on veterans, food security, pigeon rescue. Yeah. That summarized it, right? Okay. Well, Craig, thank you so much for, um, for, for uh, this 
having the pleasure of being in conversation with you. And uh, thank you for all the great work you do. And um, it's really an, an, an inspiration. And I hope it's been an inspiration to all our, everybody watching us today too. And with that, uh, go ahead. And I want people to remember that I know that I'm not as funny as I am. So please, under no circumstances, encourage my sense of humor. <laughs> all right, that will be the final note. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you, Antonio and the Thomson Reuters Foundation for the, having us. Thanks. Bye.